let's start. Yeah, sorry for the delay, but I think it was a good reason for starting late today. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to present here Mark Lovell. Um, so, who did his undergraduate PhD at the University of Durham and then proceeded to postdocs of, at the University of Amsterdam at the Max Planck Institute at Heidelberg. And now uh, currently he's, uh, well, a bit in Durham as well, but mostly based at the University of, of Iceland. He's visiting us, so please. If you're in Iceland, you don't need to have X number of huge taxpayer funded radio telescopes to be able to get a pretty yellow and red picture. You just have to have a volcano erupt 35 kilometers from your house. Go stand 30 seconds walk from your house and take a photo of it from across the bay. There we go. That saves so much more money, didn't it? Okay, so thank you very much for having me. So hey, my name is Mark Lovell. I'm going to be talking to you with about um, uh, new work that I've been doing, trying to understand lots of different dark matter models at the same time, from the perspective of their impact on satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. I'm not going to try to constrain anything today. I'm not going to say that I have certain parameter spaces allowed this allowed. What I'm going to do is give you a qualitative feel for what different um, dark matter models um, do to the properties of satellite galaxies and then going forward in future work be able to understand the sorts of questions that one needs to be asking and so sort of said all this preliminary none of this is quite yet none of this is published hopefully before some meeting we've got coming up in june that would be nice so you know people in this audience don't necessarily deal with the uh, sort of astrophysics astronomy side uh, as much as some other places. So here's a place to start. So this is a photo of the Andromeda galaxy, otherwise known M31, taken by a good friend of mine, Tim Wiles, in his uh, back garden in Durham, which if nothing else proves that it is possible in Durham to see the night sky. It's not always cloudy. <laughs> so here we have M31 itself in the middle. Uh, here we have another little satellite galaxy. This is thinks M33. This is the one that got um, destroyed by Apple when they were producing that desktop, Im desktop image a long time ago. I think one of these, it might be this one here, or it might be that one, is the M32 satellite galaxy. And we believe based on all sorts of evidence that you're probably familiar with, that we expect that behind this image of um, stars, there should also be a decay of dark matter. So what I'm doing here, if I've done this correctly, is fade from this image that we took, or that my friend took, to an image of a of a um, dark mass of the dark matter halo of the sort that M31 could possibly live in, with some choice of the color that I could go into later if you want to. And around this big yellow blob, which is the central halo of M31, we also have these small little red ones, which are satellite galaxies. Or I should say these are dark matter subhalos, and you expect that many of these should have satellite galaxies. Depending on the properties of dark matter at the particle physics level, you will get different numbers of these objects, different matter distributions within these objects. And from this, we can hope to get some information about what sort of particle physics models are best dark matter candidates from having looked at the having looked at observations of the satellites and comparing them to predictions. Um, oh, sorry, but here's another way of, uh, this is being smart and tricky. So this is another way of looking at the same thing. So this is now a hydrodynamical simulation in which we have a model for the dark matter. We also have a model for how stars are formed from gas, how stars are able to explode and force gas to be expelled from the halo in a system that looks a little bit like our own Milky Way and from the local group where you can see you've got this um, M31 object here, Milky Way here, and all the satellite galaxies. And then, if I instead I show you the books, this is uh, quite exciting. If instead I show you the dark matter, then you can see where you've got many, many more of these little lumps. And you have satellite galaxies, due to the way that gas physics works. And uh, on the other hand, if you rather than doing this with what we call cold dark matter, which could be a supersymmetric limp, could be an axion. You instead you do this with say warm dark matter, which is some stellar neutrino, maybe a gravitino, less likely. 
then you have far fewer of these little objects. There are methods that you can use for trying to look for all of these really small, tens, small objects, maybe 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses, um, using things like um, streams, nostalgic streams, and lensing. I'm not going to talk about that today. It's said to say that you expect that even the number of objects that may be 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses, the ones that should still form satellite galaxies, you will form fewer of them over here than over there. And that's oh, one sorry, the, yep. the, the world state are simulated, right? So this is all this is all simulation work, yes. Yeah, but the world it's all simulation, but it's real in the sense that you move away and you drop it, right? Well, no. So it's so it's looking at so you so you just have a synthetic box in which you say, well, I know what the statistics of mass distribution should look like from the cosmic microwave background. So I just populate a box with this distribution of um, perturbations in this collection of dark matter and gas particles, and I just allow it to flow forward in time. And then I look at the box. So in case, in case somebody else looked at the box and said. Can I find a pair of halos where one of them is about the mass of M31, one of them is the mass of the Milky Way, and they're about the distance of the mass, distance between the two, which is 750 kiloparsecs. And then I say that that is my distribution. So this is an object that's in some way supposed to be similar to the M31 and um, the to M31 and um, the Milky Way, but it's not, not the same at that level. There are things people are doing like that, you can ask me later, but not what we have here. So this is what the dark matter distribution looks like. It's also so you probably see all of these little dots in these filaments. These are actually spurious noise from the simulation. So that's something we have to cut out. But you can go from this model where this picture where these two objects look very similar to instead this one, where because of the way gas physics works, you've removed most of the gas from most of those old um, galaxy, most of those halos. And so you can probably convince yourself that you can see there are more dots in the left hand side in the CDM than in the WDM, but it's a much more difficult lift. And this is nevertheless the sort of thing that we're trying to do. Um, so there are three questions for dark matter models. Uh, here I've stuck the CDM and the WDM together. First, do we get the correct number of satellite galaxies, which is what I've already shown you. Second, do we get the correct masses for the satellites? So if I look at the velocities of stars in the middle of a uh, galaxy, how quickly are they moving? What does that tell me about the mass content? Which is something else these models can change. And if I have a model that does both of these things, but if I if I have a model that gets the correct number of satellite galaxies, does it also get the same number, same right mass at the same time? So this is one of the crucial things we want to be able to do um, is to make sure that you can satisfy all constraints at once. Oh, yes, this is um, very exciting, isn't it? And here's another way of showing the same thing. So this is what's known as the circular velocity curve. You've heard of uh, centripetal acceleration. It's just a way of showing you something what I've already been telling you. So this is just GM over R, or root GM over R, which is used as a way of describing the massive distribution inside a galaxy. You're going to be seeing quite a lot of this, so it's a good thing to get used to. Uh, here I'm just showing as the circles, the measured masses for satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. So the older ones say Draco is probably up here, and then something called, and this is Pluto's two, the crazy one, Filman one something down here. Then the lines are from a simulation, where at large radii we have, we measure from one of these simulations that I've just shown you, this particular one doesn't have the gas in it, what the mass distribution is at radii bigger than say, um, 300 kilopart or 300 parsecs, and then extrapolate them down to the middle of the thin lines. And if you want to get the right mass distribution for the right number of satellites, you need to have roughly one line for each of these dots. Now, because we've already picked 20, we've got 24 dots here, we want to use 24 lines. We pick the most massive 24 lines, and we don't quite go through all of the points. Which is already telling you that there's something in this model that's not, at least it's not as simple as what we would um, hope to just be able to see the 24 most massive of the present day and get the 24 brightest satellites that we've discovered uh, around our own way. 
It's already the case you would expect. It's not necessarily the most massive today. It's the most massive in the, in the past. And so I'll be going into this quite a few more times throughout this talk. The main thing I want to point out is that each of these curves has a maximum value. It's called a beam. So it's called a total um, say it's B max, function of R max. And that's just describing the peak of each of these curves and asking back several times. So here's some of the dark matter models that we're interested in today. So cold dark matter, this could be WIMPs or QCD axions, um, negligible velocity dispersion, collisionless, meaning these are just some particles that are thermodynamically very cold and don't have any interactions with themselves or with anything else much. They have these weak interactions very early in the universe, but those are considered not very important for um, the closest galaxy formation. And then the next one is warm dark matter. Primarily stellar neutrinos. I'm not sure if gravity is that popular at the moment, but it's here anyway. And these have a significant velocity dispersion at high redshift, which means that because if you have very small perturbations that will correspond to very small satellite galaxies, the dark matter has enough energy to jump out of those perturbations. And therefore, the perturbation doesn't form, so you have fewer objects forming small scales, which is what you see in these images, assuming here that they're all collisionless still, which is particularly good for stellar neutrinos, because these don't even have weak interactions, they just form um, at very early times from neutrino oscillations and they're completely decoupled. And it may have been detecting decay signals, 3.5 TB line, I'll come to this at the very end. You have self interacting dark matter, which could be some supersymmetric models. Um, some dark atoms. This is quite easy to write down through a particle physicist, I think. Uh, this can do something similar to warm dark matter by uh, using interactions to raise small structures at early times through dark acoustic oscillations. I'm not going to talk about that today. And also, you have these collisions between particles using this, which is typically assumed for some carbon coupling, which is slightly beyond my pay grade. And this, when you have these interactions between particles, that means you can evacuate some particles from the center of halos and you can make them less massive in their centers. Or if you have a particularly large number of um, interactions, then you can end up with a position where you have this dark matter core that forms, gets larger and larger and larger, and eventually it collapses. And so rather than getting something that's much less massive than you had to begin with within a given radius, so that all of the mass falls within that radius and therefore gets into steeper than what you thought, which is going to be really quite important. Um, fuzzy dark matter, no fuzzy dark matter about this in this today, sorry, moving onwards. Um, so it's useful to try to illustrate some differences between CDM and WDM. So I said CDM has power on all scales, one matter only has power on scales of dwarf galaxies and larger, which has resulted delaying halo formation, lowering the densities and fewer halos formed. So I think, well, what's the right way to be able to Describe this to an audience while only going 35 kilometers drive from your house. So this was my idea of how to try to explain it while only going 35 kilometers from your house, going to the volcanic eruption that happened in Iceland. In well, this was done in April. So as you can see here, the lava is hot. Therefore, it's able to overcome gravity, and you're able to have this lava flow have this remarkably flat top on it. You're able to remove this, remove the sort of perturbation because of the heat. Um, if you want to see this analogy taken too far, there was a paper out on the 1st of April this year, which explained this in, well, I would say detail, but you, you can't really say detail when it's an April 4th, can you? I know how to have fun. Um, this is the way of saying it for boring people. Um, so this is just the matter power spectrum telling you how much, how many perturbations you have. And it's between models on different scales where small, the larger scales are over this side and the small scales are over here. So CDM is this black line. You see how power at all scales, whereas in these sterile neutrino models, L8 through L12, the amount of power starts to decrease as you get to a warmer and warmer dark matter model. And so this is showing you where you start to suppress these um, structures. Um, so sterile neutrinos are generated non-thermally. However, you are able to approximate their power spec, their matter power spectrum with those other thermal relic, which is really quite interesting. If you had a true thermal relic particle, currently seems you would, through those thermal relic weak interactions, you would cause lots of problems with Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which are in um, 
opposition to current and strength in nucleosynthesis. So you can't have a thermal relic particle, but you can still use the power spectrum you get from it to approximate thermal relic and to approximate these star neutrinos, which is quite convenient. And then tend to describe them by just some number between 2.5 kV, 4.7. The work I'm going to be showing you here is about 3.3. So these these um, colors, are these models are chosen to be roughly in agreement with this line that I keep talking about. So we're somewhere between 10 and nine. And then SIDM, so in, in, in CDM, these particles are collisionless. In SIDM, instead they have collisions. So in center of a halo, each particle expects to have one, um, one interaction per, um, per Hubble time. And this is described in the subject by this self interaction cross section, where as a function of the velocity of the particles when they're interacting, you can have either a constant cross section, which is independent, one or 10, this is ruled out for reasons. Uh, so, our personal favorite at the moment is this BD100, which we did a simulation of, which we took a picture of, where you have these very strong interactions at small scales and then very low in um, cross sections at large scales. You need to have low interactions across at large scales, <coughs> sorry, at large velocities, because otherwise you would make the halos of clusters of galaxies very, very round, much rounder than we see. So you need to have a low interaction rate over here, and then you want a very high one over here so that you can create some cores to match galaxies that have a relatively low mass, and also those that have a very high mass, and therefore you need to have this gravitational or collapse of material formed in the middle. Uh, as in from baryons and so on. Um, I guess there's enough uh, ways to describe SIDM that it's quite easy to write a model that looks like that. So especially in the case of something like dark atoms. Um, just crucially, it shouldn't be able to cool very easily because otherwise you would just have everything fall to the center. You'd have some dark galaxy, which is not what we see. So to do this, I'm going to use the, I'm going to use three simulations. The first of which is the COCO cold dark matter simulation, which is an n-body simulation. So this only has dark matter in it. The ones I showed you before had dark matter and also gas physics. This one has just dark matter. So it's a sphere of radius 28 megaparsecs. For those who know such things, the particle mass of each simulation particle is 1.5 and 25. And in this region, I have about 100 Milky Way like halos for given for definition. And I'm going to select objects from this. So maybe this one, maybe that one, maybe that one that are going to be Milky Way analogs. So that's the CDM version. Now, if you keep your eyes on this really clear, I'm going to show you WM, WDM version. And you can just about see, oops, see Daisy. You can just about see how. The amount of um, small scale structure in here disappears when you said use the long dark matter power spectrum. So this has a 3.3 kV thermal relic particle. So a true thermal relic would be ruled out by nuclear synthesis, but we're using this in approximation of some neutrinos. And uh, so it has this substance of about 10, it's approximately something of a substance of 10. And then to see this a bit more clearly, here you've got a CDM on the left and WDM on the right. And the stuff you see in the filaments is spurious noise, but you still see how you get many, many little dots in here and here. And also the central masses of many of the small things in here are going to be low as well. I haven't yet shown a good way to show that in a pretty picture. So you've already seen that I'm, got, I'm quite a fan of making pretty pictures. So here's something else that I branched out into over the last five months. I was asked to give a talk a public science talk on dark matter in September. And I was then told it's going to be in a planetarium. So I thought, okay, I will try and make some images to put on the planetarium dome. So this is my first attempt using the Eagle simulation galaxy formation. And I had some conversations with the planetarium in Perlot in Reykjavik. And they have um, generously agreed to run a public event I'm going to be doing Monday after next and see what other interesting things you can communicate to the general public through this sort of medium. So on the one hand, you can do very high resolution images of, um, so this is the Coco Warm simulation, but rather than just seeing it flat, it's completely over your head. 
temperature bar at all. Or you can show people maps of gas, where here I'm showing you different temperatures. So where blue is cold, and then the red stuff here is very hot, so this is eagle. Or instead, you can also take advantage of the fact that you live in Iceland and that you have access to plant data, it's public. Oops, come on. And say, well, what if I happen to take a photo outside my kitchen window in Iceland with the northern lights overhead, and I just put the Planck CMB map behind it, and then say, well, if you were stood in my back garden looking past northern lights to the furthest light that you could see, and you chose to color it blue and red and green in between, this is what you'd see. And hopefully that will engage the great Icelandic public with science, possibly here too, if I could move it. Um, so this is the self interactive dark matter part. So, so far I've shown you a CDM simulation and a WDM simulation. Ideally, I'd have an SIDM counterpart. I don't do that. The SIDM simulations are very expensive to run, especially if you have this very high interaction rate, which is true of BD100, with these very high interaction rates and small velocities. So instead, we have one simulation that's somewhat higher resolution than what I've shown you, which does use this model. And whereas before I have effectively 102 Milky Way lot objects, here I've only got the one. And I'm going to use this model to infer what the matter distribution would be like for the population of satellites in, uh, say, a, a COCO SIDM. So this is where that object. Oh, sorry, this is what that object looks like. If you show this to somebody who's an expert in CDM, they probably won't see any difference for this. So only if you were to show the very high density peaks, you would show where you've got some collapse. And I can show that to you here, where this is this V max that I was talking about earlier. This is the peak of the circuit velocity curve. If you were doing regular cold dark matter, and you said, well, this is the V max, what would be the velocity of 400 parsecs for objects with this V max? In CDM, you would expect the solid black line to be your median and the dotted to be for particularly concentrated objects, dashed for the lower bound of least concentrated objects, given that you've got some scatter in this relationship between mass and concentration. If you look at the very massive objects, all of these in the SIDM simulation are below the dashed line. So that tells you that you have less mass in the within 400 parsecs than you do in CDM. And therefore, these are objects that are coarse, and they've got these SIDM cores, which is very useful in fitting large galaxies. Whereas the dotted line shows the concentrated objects, and you've got all of these objects at the top right that are much denser, even than you would have in NFW. So even though you've got these cross, these, even though you created these cores. Lots of them have turned into these. I have a question. Hello. Yes. Yeah, really. <laughs> so we're talking about different types of dark matter. Can yes. You, can, so you mentioned the collision with dark matter, like yep. the X and Y. What exactly are you inputting in as initial conditions for the evolution? Sorry. So How exactly are you modeling the dark matter? So the modeling for the cold dark matter, which is yeah. imps and and QCD axions, so not axion-like particles, else those are fuzzy dark matter, I'm not touching those at all today. So there, all you are assuming is that these particles, they're effectively ghosts, they pass through one another, they're just gravity, effectively taking the cosmic micro background picture that I showed you from my back garden, and using that to say, well, that's just the distribution of gaps between these particles. There's going to be some that's slightly closer together, and some that are further away. But so in your simulation, there are point particles of certain mass. Yes. So the content wave length is zero point. Yes. Okay, so how exactly are you picking the cross section? Because I guess the difference between collision with and uh, what you were calling super symmetric dark matter, the cold atom is the, the cross section. Yes. So, so I, how exactly are you doing that? So I, I didn't actually write that the algorithm that's in there. But what you will have is that you say whenever you have two particles within some given distance of one another, based on what the cross section is, they have some probability to scatter. Mm -hmm. And in this, every, all of the momentum is conserved. So, yes. Yeah. What is the difference between the CDM and yeah. the 
can sell neutrinos is just that you have the set different initial conditions. So it is effectively, so at the large scales, as I say, you have the CMB. There we go. At large scales, you have the CMB distribution, okay? And then you assume that it propagates down to smaller scales than you necessarily see in the CMB, and it's all the same. Whereas in WDM, you have this cutoff. So rather than saying that in the, so this is purely a difference in the initial conditions of the simulation between CDM and WDM, and you just have this different distribution of particle distances, and then you just run it forward, and there's no interactions between the particles not gravity. But then in the SIDM, whereas SIDM for this work has the same distribution of particles in these conditions, instead you have um, these, this other routine where if two particles sufficiently close, they have a chance to scatter. Uh -huh. So what I'm going to say for this is that I use this simulation result, set of simulation results, to make a probabilistic estimate based on, if I go to say the COCO CDM simulation, I want to turn it into an SIDM simulation. I take each of the subhalos that I'm interested in, which I'll describe in a moment, and then I will say, based on its mass before it fell into the, into the Milky Way and the halo, it has some chance to have either a core or an NFW line cusp, or one of these very extreme cusps. Okay, so I've got my three models here my CDM model, which is Coco CDM, um, my, C my CDM simulation is Coco CDM, WDM, Coco WDM, my Coco SIDM in quotation marks is a convolution of the set of halos that I find in Coco CDM uh, that have been involved with the properties of subhalos from this simulation. So you make some inference as to what this might be like. It's not particularly um, accurate to a very fine precision because here I'm only taking objects of one specific redshift, redshift one um, as an input, whereas here there'll be all sorts of redshifts actually for redshift four, which is the first thing to fall in the sky. But it's enough to be able to get a feeling for how the model works and to understand what needs to happen. The answer is that you're probably going to need even more extreme cross-section than we already have, unless high redshift do something interesting. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to find some notary handle analogs, maybe this one, maybe this one. Find the subhalos that have fallen in, which I'll show you a picture of that shortly, and establish which simulated subhalos could be viable hosts for working with satellites. So in this picture, I have subhalos out in the sky above us. We have satellites with measured luminosities, measured densities. And I'm going to say, based on the densities of these objects that we've observed in the sky, which of the objects in this, in this picture are going to be able to match that. Um, um, <laughs> so the military host selection is this rather broad mass range, if you know such things. Um, isolated, we're able to find the same object in CDM and WDM, which you'll be able to see the properties of large scales are the same, at small scales they differ. And we can use one of those merger trees to look at the different output times across the simulation. There are 160 in total. So 160 times we save all the particles, save the particles, save the particles, save their positions, and then we can work out which subhalo is which from snapshot 80, 81, 82, 83. So we can work out at what time this object fell in. And we're going to remove from the sample halos that have merger time for solving the accretion time. Those who are interested in such things as the chance take of time. So if an object's very massive and it falls in at very early times, it's probably going to merge with the central halo. So we remove those. And also some of them that move really close to wherever the Milky Way disk would be, because these simulations don't have baryons, but I just say that the disk of the Milky Way is about 20 kiloparsecs. Other studies have shown that objects that move within 10 kiloparsecs center are probably going to be disrupted because you've got this very dense disk. And so I remove anything that moves within 10 kiloparsecs too. So here's an example. So I have some satellite galaxy that falls into 
we want to reanalog at some time. And then it goes on some orbits and it hits the pericenter, what's known as pericenter, which is this green point here. And at uh, the present time, it's found to be at this particular point. And that's within this 300 kiloparsec radius. Therefore, this is allowed. So I don't always use 300 kiloparsecs for different parts of this calculation. Virial radius, that some of you know what that means. Um, on the other hand, there will be some occasions where the, parsec, where the subhalo manages to go outside of 300 kiloparsecs, in which case we remove it from the sample. And also, if something goes too close to the center within where I say the disk is, then I move to. I should also say sometimes I don't, sometimes you can't always find this object at the very last time. It might have in the merged in the simulation just because it has limited resolution, but I retain all of those. And so this is what you get before things start collapsing. So uh, this is the circular velocity profiles I've told you before. So this is showing you what GM over R is as a function of radius. Now the green dots are the observations. So these are these 33 objects in the sky around the Milky Way that we've measured um, the H and RH for. So these are the same objects that we saw in that plot with the gray and the green. And I want to see which subhalos would do a good job of going through those points. So if I do CDM, that's delineated roughly by the black lines here, or more broadly by the gray band, which you can just about see at the top, and it extends down to here. So we're about to the red. So in CDM, you have the dense halos. In WDM, because of this later formation time, density is suppressed slightly by the CDM, but enough that if you say compare the black and the red lines, which are these limiting cases for this plot, then the red lines, particularly for low mass halos at one time 10 to nine, are suppressed. So you are automatically, before you do any stripping, I should say that, this is just objects in the initial time. Uh, before you try and do any stripping, the densities are slightly lower, which means that the red band is slightly more in agreement with where the green points are than the black band is marginally. And in SIDM, you have this much denser, sorry, it's much less dense set of um, velocity profiles because you have these cores. Um, so ironically, if you have a very small thing that, form, that fell in early, it will be quite concentrated. And so its core will be quite small. And that's why you have a circular velocity curve for some low mass SIDM objects, which is 10 to the nine, which is down here, is denser than something that fell in late and massive. 10 over here. So as you can see in CDM, you can sort of fit all of these green points even before stripping, except for the ones that are down here. Uh, in WDM, you're already slightly closer than you were. So 10 minutes. Sorry? Will that suit you? What? Is that okay? Yeah. Oh. Am I allowed to say it's not okay? Or are people just going to get up and leave? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, okay, and so does have the and whereas if you have purple, then you're going to have to have this gravithermal collapse in order to you're going to have to take these curves that you have and make them denser. So stripping is going to take, say, this this red line is going to put it down. You're going to remove mass, whereas with purple, it's already sufficiently dense that instead you have to have this gravithermal collapse to put everything up. And I need to speed, speed up, so I'm just going to say that. I just fit these objects with an FW profile, so these so they here. Um, these are already so out of what, what is the halo stripping? What are you doing? So then halo stripping, you take a small halo, you drop it into a big one, and because the small halo has a finite size, it's sort of quite large. Um, that means that the gravitational field of the central halo is strong enough to remove material from the outside. And also to some degree from the inside of the satellite as well. So the total amplitude of this, say this red curve, is going to decrease over time. And uh, yeah. um, to apply this stripping routine done by these people. So there's something through the virus and we talk to particularly quite a lot. Use the N in this, that's familiar. Um, 
the two particular things that I want to say, to be able to say that this satellite in the, in the sky is, can be fit by given subhalo from the picture. Uh, when I do my stripping, I want to take, say, this red line and decrease it until it goes through the green. As I decrease it, the peak, this R max, is going to move to the left. And strict R max has to be larger than the size. So the halo has to be larger than the size of the satellite I'm trying to fit. Important. Also have some tidal radius criterion in here that uses some real data, which I won't go into now. Uh, but this is uh, also somewhat important. We can ask about that later if you want. Uh, I split these, the observed satellites into four regions. So particularly, so large size high density, which I'm going to describe with the Draco satellites. Um, small size low density, the O4. High density, small building one, which is this yellow dot, this yellow dot, this yellow dot. And then finally, crater two, which is down here, which is the most difficult one. Um, so it's an example of this, which is what we've heard just now. So I have this particular point. I start off with some tidal radius, which is based on what the base, which is effectively in orbit, based on the orbit of the satellite, what degree of stripping can I get? And so I start off with this red curve, and then I strip it, and then I get this orange curve, which goes to the green cross. And I find that the tidal radius of this new curve that I've drawn operation this curve is the same as the tidal radius that I would expect from the orbit. Therefore, this is an agreement. The peak of the curve is to the right of the green cross. So that's good. That's a good fit. If instead I have something that's denser to begin with, this red curve, and then the, in order to get the orange line to go to the green cross, the peak is to the left of the green cross, then this is no good. That means that the satellite is larger than the subhalo. Can't have that. That's bad. If instead um, the orbital uh, tidal radius is too big and I think that I need to do a lot of stripping, then I need more stripping than I can get out of the orbit. The orbit went, didn't go close enough to the center of the halo, and therefore um, this amount of stripping is unfeasible. So that's also a bad result. So I've already mentioned that. Um, do I want to go through this? Um, so the main thing that I'd focus on is particularly this crater two object, where the strip R max that you would need is much smaller than this. For most of these halos, is much smaller than the um, size of the halo, the size of the satellite. Sorry. So most of the objects in this model can't fit the satellite, but it is the case that because warm enough matter halos are less concentrated, we do have that tiny bit more opportunity to fit these objects which is quite interesting. Um, also, oh, did I clean up by accident? No, not quite, good. Uh, you have the strict mass, so how much mass do we need to remove in these different models? So I should also say that this is somewhere that the SIDM model does quite well. So this is just evidence that you want to cut, that a core is good, even if you might want to get that core from somewhere else, which I'll come to in a moment. So in terms of the amount of stripping that you get between these models in, CDM you have uh, in most of these models surprisingly need about the same amount of stripping, even in, in crater two where you have the SIDM model as this core, you still need to remove quite a few, quite, you still need to remove about 50% of all of the mass within the center of the halo, which seems a little bit odd. Um, but it is the case that shown in this paper by and collaborators, that if you have this very low density warm dark matter, um, dark matter profile in the sort of model we're interested in, which is right over here, the amount of energy that you need from supernovae to be able to use supernova feedback to explosions of stars to be able to drive material from the center of the halo crater core that way, then that's a lot easier than in, say, CDM, which is in the limits over here. So at least the combination of WDM and um, so feedback may well provide an answer to the question of grade two. Um, I'll just skip that and then try to end here. So Milky Way satellite mass function. And so what I'm going to do here is rather than say, well, I've got each of these individual objects and they're all falling into 
uh, Milky Way like halos. So each Milky Way like halo is allowed to have a certain number of satellites because our one halo has at least these 33 satellites. And I want to see what uh, agreement there is between um, if, in, if I set this condition that each each galaxy needs to have one Draco, one Leo 4, one Crater 2, and so on. And I try to populate the Milky Way mass function that way. Uh, what does that do? Um, so I won't go into the algorithm behind this. It might change by the time that it's released. So this is just showing what's known as this mass function. Um, so it's showing how many objects you have as a function of this in full M200. In SIDM, you have this very odd feature where you don't, where you only have about five objects populated in halos that are more massive than five than one times ten to the nine because we have this relatively sharp cross off. Where if you're more massive than this, you have to have a core, so you can't fit dense objects. But instead, you end up fitting everything into very um, small density object into very low mass objects. So this is just telling you that when you have a self interacting dark mass model, it needs to have be even more extreme, it needs to have more interactions at say 20 points per second velocity in order to be able to get these objects to collapse and then they're able to map more massive halos. In WDM, because you have these relatively low densities, it seems that this roughly hits the sweet spot for uh, being able to get the right densities in the right halos, which is why the solid um, curve, which is the mass function, uh, that we infer is relatively close to the dash line, which is the mass function of all the halos that are available. So what this tells you is the fact that there's little difference between the solid and the dashed, that we're fist that we're having roughly one halo, one satellite in every halo. Whereas in CDM, you've got this gap between the dashed and the solid, which suggests that um, you um, have too many dense halos to fit all of the satellites in your system so far, which is a very important asterisk. What this might be telling you is that there's a large number of very dense satellites still out there that we've yet to discover. But if we don't find them, then warm up matter seems to be a better fit. Um, how long have I got? Sorry? One or two minutes. One or two minutes. Okay. Um, I will... Not do that. I'll, pre I'll just finish with this one. Just say so you can do things like just count the number of satellites that you expect. There's something that somebody raised with me a day or two ago. That how many satellites do you expect? What well, depends who you ask. If you ask Oliver Newton, who worked with me and Charles Frank, then you expect that there should be between 100 and 120 satellites in total. Once you've been able to correct for the fact that you've not looked at the whole sky, that you've not looked at. Um, but there might be some galaxies sufficiently faint and just not going to see them. We expect there should be between 100 and 150, which is roughly the same number that you get in the warm dark matter simulation. There's no SIDM in here because the SIDM is based off the CDM. Whereas if you think that you need to have 270s, which is Alex Tillitsawagner and colleagues, then um, instead, you need CDM and the WDM is ruled out. So, just to say, when you see questions about is WDM ruled out by Milky Way satellite counts, then it really depends on who's doing the estimate. Um, this is just another way of saying if you look at the very massive halos, you say what fraction of massive halos from more massive than 10 to 5 have a galaxy in them. And according to this fitting procedure, in WDM, 85% of them fall, in CDM, it's only 50%. And in this particular SIDM model, it's rather fewer than that. Maybe because you have all of these, so that's telling you that 50% of these satellites are too dense in a sense. So you can have five satellites that are dense enough to fit Draco that are massive, but you've only got one Draco. So you have to leave some satellites empty. And that's just a way of estimating what the masses of these things are. Uh, oh, I need to mention that, don't I? Yes. Um, next year, the CRISM experiment is going to be launched. It's going to go looking for this 3.5 KV line that I keep talking about. First discovered almost 10 years ago now, or reported at least. Um, so the most important thing is the line width, which is particularly broad for dark matter, broader than you expect for emission line in galaxies. And therefore, I did a prediction three years ago that says that by using simulations of clusters of galaxies, that 
particularly the velocity dispersion that you would measure for a line. So when this X-ray telescope is launched, it does observations of, of this cluster of galaxies. If you see a line that's around somewhere between 500 and 700 kilometers per second, that is quite possibly dark matter emission or emission from decaying dark matter. And that would probably be the best one that we have. And if we do not see it, I promise to shut up for the first time since 2010. <laughs> So I've put it here in red outline. Uh, so this is what I've said. So this is just showing you roughly what CDM and WDM and SIDM do. I'm going to have at least the thickness and modification of the SIDM model and some more pretty nice sky. I even have green. Did you see any green from EHT? No. I have, well, I have red and I have green from my neighbors. This, this one is my house. This is where I live. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, very much for the pretty pictures and the talk. And so now we have some time for questions. Sorry? No, I just want to read that. Oh, I just want to read them. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I have a question regarding the computer. What exactly is the uh, dividing line between gold and water? Well, how can you say that you invalidate water and gas matter? That is true that warm dark matter effectively, cold dark matter is a limit of warm dark matter. So cold dark matter is the limit where warm dark matter is, um, tends to, the particle mass tends to infinity. The best limit actually comes more from the particle physics side. So if you have this down neutrino that I keep rattling on about, it should have a maximum mass of about 20 keV absolute maximum from X-ray limits. So I've told you about possibly detecting it. The detection limits get stronger with mass to the power five. Okay. So as you go to higher and higher stellar neutrino masses, you're more and more likely to have already seen it. So if you are able to, so if you're able to rule out with something like this a thermal relic mass that corresponds to the stellar neutrino of 20 keV, then you said, well, it looks like, from that perspective, our favorite warm dark matter particle candidate is ruled out. But otherwise, there is always going to be this gray area. And I think that's why people often don't work on this as much, because there is this degeneracy between dark matter physics and baryon physics. In, in your situation, too small to succeed. Which one's that? There are lots of lots of fancy names, and I forget them sometimes. Uh, Tremaine, uh, oh dear. Have I heard of the Tremaine gun bound? Yes. Can I remember what it is right now? No. Um, uh, but, 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 I, I have to get back to you. I have heard of that. I cannot remember what it is. I'll go and have a look. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, I mean, but you do a lot of models and you question if you go if you go to the next generation of uh, technology growth, like you're putting the whatever, would you be able to really disentangle and say one of them is better than others, or you could not let's say you go with diversity for quite a while? So the best Euclid option is with the gravitational lensing okay. that I mentioned okay. rather than this. So what Euclid is able to do is find lots of gravitational lenses, uh, which with sufficient resolution, you can use to try to look for evidence of these very small 10 to seven, 10 to the mass things. So with Euclid, you can find lots of these at relatively low resolution. And then with the EELT, you can follow up those low resolution images with high resolution imaging 
and there you might be able to get enough photons and enough smaller pixel space that you can use that to find the difference. I don't think there's any way that you could work in satellite galaxies for this. Okay. Well, before you mentioned tidal friction, yep. uh, I'm considering now sticking down by the head. Yes. So we said before, sticking down to the potato dog file, you just discard it yep. from the human. Yep. But because you think it is it possible by the first flyby, or because it's just efficiently by getting this and being gone? So it's partially yes. So one of the things that this is um, this is trying to get around is there's a suspicion that we don't trust the way that tidal stropping is done by the simulations themselves. So here I've taken an object when it's fallen in, okay, and say, okay, from this moment I am going to model this NFW and I'm going to use the simulation method to work out what it does during its first orbit. So there is this concern, if you instead you were to just do what people have done, which is look at the actual simulation data and track the object through all of its orbits, that the end body mechanism might not be completely accurate, okay? In the way that it tracks the orbit, in the way because you have limited resolution, the object that you're tracking isn't dense enough, you might end up removing it too early. So what I am doing here is only tracking something really as far as is tracking something as far as the first pericenter saying is it still and saying where is it relative to the center then and yes effectively assuming that if something just comes within the within the disc radius at that time then it just gets squashed um because i don't then trust being able to go second third fourth pericenter that it's but not, not trusting the way that the orbit is calculated effectively. Um, but if you would, one of the things that you would do to improve this is you could say, well, I'm going to assume that the disk has some particular orientation. And if you move directly through the disk, then the tidal field of the disk is, is strong enough to completely destroy the subhalo. Or if it flies over the top of the disk, then it isn't. So that's one of the things we can do to improve this. So yeah, so it is the case that you could imagine something could move really close to the disk and just be really heavily stripped rather than being disrupted. But um, already when I discussed this with one collaborator recently, he said, it's so complicated, Mark, I don't know how you're going to turn this into a paper. <laughs> and I would say, well, what about semi-analytic models of galaxy formation and then just go backwards and forwards for half an hour and nobody's going to tell But yes, that's another level of complexity that one can add. Well, well, so, well, so simulation, well, so there is the, the simulation version effectively, which is what. So this result is based, so my very simple model is based off, before the disk is based off work done by Rob Grand and the Auriga people, which as far as I'm aware is the highest resolution disk simulation that's been done. And he found that most of the objects outside 10 kiloparsecs of the center survived when he had this full hydrodynamical disk in the middle and those that moved within 10 kiloparsecs didn't. Thank you. So one quick one. Yeah. Right, yeah. So we only solve the blast operation, as you say. Work, there's quite a lot of work done about 10 years ago on this thermal relic. Um, so on these thermal velocities at late times. And basically they argued that for uh, values of the walnut matter particle mass, 
that are of interest for affecting the number of satellites and so on and are in agreement with um, observations, but those thermal velocities at late times were not relevant. It didn't make much change. It didn't make any much difference to density. Sorry. So at small masses, so it would it would take fact that small masses that are so small that the satellite would not have formed in, formed in the first place. That's what was found. So it was. Um, I can't remember what the name of the paper was. It was Andrew Metro, and then there was a Yang Gao one. Um, this is the Catch 22 paper. But if you form a halo, this is well, a halo that would have uh, physically relevant thermal motions, it's not formed because of the power of the cut off. And I need to remind myself what the twine gun band is. Okay, so I mean, we're already running a bit late, so thanks very much, everyone, for coming and thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe. 